Good morning and welcome to Pentecost Sunday, that Sunday when that we celebrate in the church year with the descent of the Holy Spirit onto those in Jerusalem and indeed living in you and me as believers in Jesus Christ. Before we read our call to worship this morning, uh, I just would like to make a... Uh, a comment uh, today, and that is uh, with the violence that has gripped our communities, gripped our nation in the recent days over the death of George Floyd. The Bible tells us in Romans and in many other places that we are to hate evil, and we have seen great evil in these days, both in the needless and senseless death of this man and in the wretched violence that has followed his death. As believers in Jesus Christ, George Floyd's death should outrage us out of our complacency into uh, an emotion of wanting to end racism and discrimination of every sort across this land. As Christians, it is unbecoming for any of us to hold racist thoughts. All human beings are made in the image of God. And so we mourn with his family, but we also call out those who have resulted in uh, violence uh, in these days, that they might end their senseless acts and join hands in prayer and in concern that we would rid racism peacefully and lovingly from our land. Our call to worship comes from the prophet Joel this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord to the prophet, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old shall dream dreams and your young shall see visions. Let's pray together. Praise and glory to you, creator spirit of God. You make our bread of the communion of Christ's body to heal and reconcile and to make us the body of Christ. You make the wine of communion of Christ's saving blood to redeem the world. You are truth. You come like the wind of heaven, unseen, unbidden. Like the dawn, you illuminate the world around us. You grant us a new beginning every day. You warm and comfort us. You give us courage and fire and strength beyond our everyday resources. Be with us, Holy Spirit, in all that we ask and think, all that we do, this and every day. Amen. Again, welcome as we continue to live stream our services here. I would encourage you uh, during this day to uh, spend it with the Lord as this is the Lord's day. I want to thank... Uh, my daughter, Elizabeth Williams, for uh, our prelude, and then uh, William Tolson and <clears throat> Helen Huntsel as they bring us our special music, and Jennifer as she leads and oversees all of that here at our service. Your session um, decided this past week that we would resume services next Sunday for in-person worship, and so we look forward to welcoming you Back then, we have arranged the sanctuary to be able to social distance. Um, <clears throat> if you're a member of our congregation, uh, you will have seen and um, uh, the kind of rules and regulations that uh, we've tried to set in place to protect people. But let me just say from this pulpit, we welcome you. I long to have you back in our house for covenant worship. But if you feel unsafe, if you feel insecure, if you feel like you have some health concerns, it would 
encourage you to stay in, inside, I would tell you, remain home and watch us on Facebook or listen to us on YouTube or on the radio on the Sundays we're on the radio. Uh, there is no shame, there is no guilt in being cautious with your health. But if you do feel like uh, you're able to get out, uh, not to use these past 10 or 12 weeks as an excuse not to come back, but just I hope that you have a hunger, a homesickness to gather here. And so we'll look forward to welcoming you. Uh, our women's Bible study is taking a break for uh, the summer. We will occasionally have some, some uh, uh, video teachings through the summer, but we'll resume in the fall as we usually do. And men's community Bible study will continue uh, online uh, on Facebook and on our church website and on YouTube uh, at least for the next uh, few weeks as we kind of sort out how to social distance as we gather back together. I uh, would remember uh, the food pantry during these days of increased need. And of course, I would remind you that um, the work of your church here goes on. And I encourage you to continue with your tithes and offerings during these days. We have called on God's name. We have lifted before him our praise. Now may we come before him in a time of confession. Let's pray together. Faithful and dependable Father, we are unwise and fickle in all our ways. In Christ we are new creations, full of noble desires to serve and obey you. In him we are full of faith, eager to delight you. But in our humanity we are knitted to flesh, uh, sinful flesh and double-mindedness in all our ways. Our motives are always mixed and tinged with selfishness and self-exhortation. We often doubt your love, your word, your power, and your wisdom. We inherit our sinful nature from Adam, and we continue to choose sin every day. Father, forgive us for uh, this fallenness that will stick to us until the day we leave these sinful bodies behind. Thank you that in Christ you do not treat us as we deserve. Thank you for the hope that one day we will be only new creation and single-minded in our love and worship of you. Lord Jesus, you never doubted the goodness of your Father or wandered from the mission he gave you. With single-minded faith and obedience, you suffered in our place. You temp tempted and tried as we often are, you remain steadfastly the same, always devoted to rescuing inconsistent uh, people like us. Thank you for your unchanging and unchangeable love and obedience that have become our own. Holy Spirit, we desperately need your help in order to persevere and survive our weakness and fickleness. Strengthen us with Christ. Give us a desire and ability to steadfast and faith to be steadfast and faithful in all our ways, to trust completely in our Savior. When, when you leave us to discover uh, our wavering hearts, help us to acknowledge our foolish, foolishness and sinfulness. May we hide in the everlasting arms of Jesus. Forgive us of our sins, separated as far as the east is from the west. For we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
Our Old Testament <coughs> reading this morning comes from Psalm 104, verses 24 through 34. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan which you form to frolic there. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Blessed be the reading in the hearing of God's holy word. Now we have our special music.
Thank you, William Herring. Now to our New Testament reading this morning it comes from the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 9, excuse me, verses 20, excuse me, verses 19 through 23, chapter 20. Sorry. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands inside. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Blessed be the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. As we come to our prayer time this morning, <coughs> there are a number of uh, things that we would lift up before the Lord, so let's bow our heads together. Father God, as we come this morning, we come with grateful hearts that you have used um, these last 10 or 12 weeks for your glory. Even though we've not been able to gather here, Father, you have used um, technology and other means to continue your work. And then now, Father, as we come back together next Sunday for corporate worship, we're just overwhelmed at your goodness to us. We pray that you would bless our time. We pray that you would keep that time um, as a special safe time for all of us. Father, we pray that we would be honored uh, to come back to your house and that you would be honored through our worship here. Father, thank you for those who have faithfully sustained our ministry here during these days. Thank you for the faithfulness of this covenant family. Father, as we think about these days, we are reminded how much you love us and how much you hate evil. Father, we pray for our community, we pray for our state and our nation in these days, not only of pandemic, but of racial tension and violence. Father, wipe this ugliness from our hearts. There is no place for it in the kingdom of heaven as all humanity is created in the image of God. And so, Father, forgive us for our sin as a nation But use this time to draw us closer to you, to, to show and contrast evil with the goodness of Christ. And may we lift him up as a light to all men. Father, we certainly pray for our covenant family and community in these days, for the health concerns that are all around us. We would remember the Morgan family, particularly today, Lord, but there are others who continue to struggle with 
not just sickness, but treatments with a variety of conditions. There are those who are suffering economically because of the pandemic. There are those who are struggling relationally because of it. The tensions of added stress there to the tensions of life in general, Father, can so overwhelm. And on this day when we celebrate Pentecost, we pray, O oh Father, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in all of our hearts boldly and mightily to bring peace and justice and kindness and goodness to us. Father, may your Spirit groan before your throne for us in words that we do not even know for the cares of our hearts. Father, we certainly pray for all of those on the front line, not only in the front line of battling our pandemic, but in battling this violence that has gripped our nation. Keep them safe. Father, we pray for our levels of economic uh, strength for those at every economic level. Father, we pray for this church, that we would be a light in our community, that we would come before your face with humility and asking that you would hold us tight in these days. And we make this prayer, O oh Lord, in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, welcome back, William, now. That will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. That in thine ocean depths set a richer be. O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. Restores its borrowed ray that in thy sunshine's blaze it stay may brighter be oh joy that seekest me through pain. I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise not in vain. That morn shall tearless be. O cross that lifteth up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. Does life's glory dead that from the ground their blossoms red that life shall endless be
Thank you, William and Helen and Elizabeth. It's been so much fun these last several uh, weeks to uh, be able to utilize uh, talent from our community for our worship. And we have certainly been blessed uh, by that. If you'll be turning in your Bibles uh, to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 will be there beginning in verse 22 in just, uh, just a few minutes. I don't know if you've ever noticed how the physical and the spiritual uh, relate together. In everyday life, we often fail to take uh, notice of this, but even in our humanity, uh, there is this wonderful joining of physical and spiritual. These two can be so intimately joined together that an outsider would not even perhaps notice. Seems so common that to someone unfamiliar to the event, the person, the place, it would pass right over. Let me give you a few examples of what I mean here. For so much of what Christ did and said carried meaning both for the physical and beyond into not just the natural realm, but into the realm of spiritual. I'll give you a couple of examples before we actually move to our text on communion. Newlyweds. Newlyweds share a kiss. To the outsider, the average person on the street, this might seem like a normal or almost <clears throat> insignificant event. <laughs> Frankly, to some, it might seem almost vulgar to do that in public. But this very commonplace event that takes place everywhere around the world between the couple themselves could be a monumental communication. It can be conveying the deepest love and desire. It can mean for them going way beyond simply the physical act of a kiss to an emotional and spiritual union and depth <clears throat> that the average bystander would never realize. Or let's say two men you see shaking hands. Now this is an event that happens every day again around the world. Uh, it often goes unnoticed. Well, today it might be a fist pump or an elbow bump, but for most of us, we know and see every day men shaking hands. It goes unnoticed. It goes unregistered with the average bypasser. But what if that coming together and shaking hands is between two men who have been bitter rivals for many years and in that one act they have buried years of contempt and frustration and anger and come together in a moment of reconciliation and friendship restored. Well, what about common things as well as common actions? Things that in themselves are highly charged with emotion that represent something spiritual to a specific person, perhaps. A cake. Just this week, and uh, my daughter and her two children came down to visit us, and my wife made a cake. And just a common pound cake. But what if that cake is a wedding cake at a wedding ceremony? 
Same ingredients go into the cake. Scientifically, they are identical, and yet because of the situation, because of the circumstance, the wedding cake carries enormous weight and meaning that a regular cake might not. Take my grandfather's chair, for example. It sat in his bedroom for years and years. It was an extraordinarily unremarkable chair. Uh, frankly, uh, if I had to be honest with you, it was a really ugly chair. It sat really too low to the ground to do anything, to get up. It was too deep for him. It was too deep for me. And yet I kept that chair in my home after my grandfather died for more than a decade cherishing each memory every time I look at that chair. What about music? Music is just the knitting together of various notes on a piano as we heard today or a violin as we've heard in weeks gone past or a harp and yet properly put together Music can raise our hearts, our emotions, our spirituality to heights that we, we can't hardly even communicate sometimes. Or take my father-in-law's war medals, the medals that he received during the Korean War. They are just small bits of metal and cloth and yet for him as he gazes up at the wall and looks at that framed collection of all the medals that he received and all the awards he was given it represents a time of war of great friendship of fellowship with his fellow soldiers of Lives lost, memories treasured, and some perhaps that he can never forget. Ordinary things invested with very specific significance and sanctity because of what they are associated with. So it is with communion. The bread, the cup, the fellowship almost unnoticed to the average unregenerate eye and yet so full of meaning for us. And so as we come to our passage today, Mark 14, beginning at verse 22 and going through 26, uh, may we stand as we do each week in the honor of reading God's Word as they did in the days of Ezra, so we do here as we read God's Word. Mark 14, 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to His disciples saying, Take, eat, this is My body. Then He took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them. And they all drank from it. This is My blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. He said to them, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Father, bless the reading and the hearing of this, your most holy word. For We pray that we would see no man save Jesus Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. We continue this week in part three of our series on communion. And I have entitled today's sermon simply, Bread and Wine. Now Jesus picked these very common elements for this, as J.B. Phillips has called it, and as we have referred to his work many times, an evergreen memorial. The bread and the wine from the meal that they had just eaten, whether it was unleavened bread or whether it was a single loaf of leavened bread, 
not really the point. The point is that he has chosen from the meal that they have just enjoyed, the Passover meal, the meal to which the new covenant is is tied but not exactly the same. And he has brought these things and fused them with great, great meaning. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again, Paul says. Jesus says, you do this in remembrance of me. The ordinary has become extraordinary for us in communion. Again, it's not that the bread and the wine somehow change their scientific reality, but it is fused with a very spiritual reality that the presence of Christ meets us in this meal. When we eat and drink the bread and the cup, we do it in the very presence of Christ. We see that from the examples that we used opening up, that there are simple elements of everyday life that are real and commonplace, and yet for certain individuals they carry some sort of vested, pure emotional meaning. And so it is for us as we come to the table, these elements carry spiritual nourishment and meaning. The physical world is full of spiritual realities. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of tr grace and truth. We can, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we can more easily appreciate goodness, beauty, truth, when, as Philip says, they are embodied in a person or a place or an action. How do you define kindness apart from the act of it? How do you define love apart from the physical reality of seeing it take place, feeling it emotionally? can never properly know God, the supreme reality, until he became a man and tabernacled with us. And so our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, picked these earthly elements, these earthly things, and gave them heavenly duty. The bread, the wine, commissioned by him, as part of this sacred meal to represent his body and his blood. The focal point, the spiritual apex of our worship is found in these common elements. The early church, the church of Acts that we think about today on Pentecost Sunday, the early church found this simple Eucharist, the very height of their worship and their contact with the living Savior. The unseen Master was there with them as they shared this meal. And so we today in celebrating this living thread that trace goes all the way back to our Savior Himself, we come and share in these humble elements with Christ here with us at the table. It is our crowning time of worship to be able to eat and drink and fellowship with Him. The right has, uh, has, has talked about, we've talked about in the past, this right of fellowship together. 
and the need for fellow worshipers to gather at his table. And it brings, we have said, nourishment and spiritual health, inspiration for us until he returns again. Next week or so, we'll talk about how we will not eat this meal in heaven because it is for us to eat here till he returns. It is a marvelous mystery that we walk by faith in Jesus Christ as we come to the table. This planned meeting place of the physical and the spiritual as they come together is the focal point of life because we are here fellowshipping with the one who gives life and who is true life. Streams of pure light break upon our souls as we eat the bread and drink the cup in fellowship, remembering and embracing our Savior, secure in our future as we eat the bread and drink the cup. The reality is that we know that we have a secure future in heaven with our Savior because He has given us this sacrament to enjoy as a living thread till He returns. It is this secure te- future that we find when we come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, God is here with us at our table. Whether you feel Him or not, He is there. These humble elements of bread and wine remind us of the humility of our own Savior, don't they? They remind us of the simpleness and yet the profoundness of who Jesus was, of his teaching. They reflect his humble birth, his atoning death on the cross, the manger, the carpenter shop, the donkey ride into Jerusalem, the wooden cross, the borrowed tomb, all remind us, dear friends, that we serve a humble yet risen Savior. And as we Think about all of these things. It is not that the manger or the donkey or the cross or the carpenter shop or anything else in Jesus' life, even the bread and wine, it is not that they have any power within themselves. It is the work of Christ that gives them meaning and significance. Where majesty comes together in the symbols of the bread and wine. The graciousness of our Savior to provide this meal for us. In His generosity to us, it should overwhelm us as we take the bread and take the wine. This, this meal is not a jewel plucked from His treasure house and given to us but it is his giving of himself to us in the bread and wine. The symbols of his body and blood that we are to find this crucified love for you and for me. I mentioned earlier this evergreen memorial, this living thread for our nourishment and inspiration. Well, let me tell you how that is. <clears throat> what causes us to be reconciled to Christ? It is the blood and the broken body on the cross. And so as we come to this meal, both of these, this reconciliation as well as this redemption, come together in the meal of communion. We see both Jesus invites us to the fellowship of this meal even as He has come into our hearts. He has reconciled us to Himself so that when the Father sees you, He does not see your sinfulness. He sees the righteousness 
of Christ that has clothed you. He sees his son when he sees you. And it is this act of reconciliation that we find in the bread of wine that draws us and reminds us of the cross itself. Redemption, reconciliation, the forgiveness of sins and the imputation of righteousness to us join together and we see and are reminded as we come to his table of what he has so graciously and generously done for us. <clears throat> but coming to the table is just not about my soul being reconciled to God. We come to the table in fellowship, don't we? We meet our Savior here. And it is not just fellowship with our Savior, but it is fellowship with our fellow men and women, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It is the gracious fellowship of the table that we long for even in these days when we can't come to the table. Our communion, our holy meal has all, will always leave us wanting more if it does not produce some sight of, of solidarity amongst believers. After all, who can hold a grudge against a fellow believer and still come to the table and share the cup and the bread with that believer? There's fellowship of the covenant family when we come to the table and share the Eucharist. Philip says that it's an ordained place of deepest fellowship for the committed to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Even in our imperfect lives, we join with Him and with each other at His holy table. So let me close with just a couple of thoughts about this idea of nourishment. How this meal should satisfy our souls and work in our hearts to encourage spiritual growth. We all can be suffocated by the cares of this world and that's why the Lord has so graciously given us the Sabbath day, a day that has been set aside for Him that we might bring part of our time, talent, and treasure to bear in worshiping Him. But here in this meal we draw close because we are here with Him. And even as we eat the bread and drink the cup, it becomes part of us, does it not? These elements are not just to be looked at, but they are to be eaten and drunk. Through the physical absorption of the bread and wine, it becomes part of us. And so as we come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, we feast on the body and blood of Christ here in this ceremony, in this sacred meal, in this Eucharist. And it is as if he, we are ingesting Him. And he is becoming part of who we are. He is helping us to grow spiritually in Him and to conform us to His likeness. As we come to the table, it is spiritual nourishment to eat the bread and drink the cup in the presence of our Savior. We absorb Christ into our souls even as we absorb the bread and cup into our bodies. I don't know about you, but I am homesick not only for worship, which will start back next week, but I am homesick for communion. I am homesick for coming to his table, for fellowshipping with my Savior and with my fellow believers. And I hope you share in that homesickness. And I hope when we can finally gather at his table, it will be a time of great joy, the apex of our worship, and a time of nourishment for your soul. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this, your word. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would instill in us a longing for your table. 
For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for the benediction, may the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God the Father, who loved us and by His grace gave us an eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you this day until Jesus comes again and forevermore. Amen. Amen.